Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's webinar on team building. Uh, my name is Dan Chase, and I'm going to be uh, facilitating this webinar on a, you know, a, a pretty important topic. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we actually have a lot of interest in this topic. And, and I think we're going to be able to talk about some things that will be useful to you, even if not anything massively revelatory, but, but give you some things to think about in terms of uh, your own team building and your own team leadership. Uh, I will tell you that team building used to be a part of the standard supervisor training that we used to offer. And we kind of got away from that for a, a number of reasons. There are some people, to, to be honest with you, that are kind of turned off by the topic of team building. Uh, and, and I want to show you why. Look at this uh, graph for a second here. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, when they think of team building, they conjure up images of trust falls and, you know, different goofy things that, that managers have tried to do. And I, I saw this and I thought, you know, I think this is how a lot of people feel. Or they feel like it's supposed to teach them teamwork and responsibility and communication, all that kind of good stuff. But really, if you look at the bottom pie chart there, all it teaches them is that they hate people. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I've certainly had that experience before. And so we want to treat this topic with some seriousness and actually have some data and some evidence-based research on team building and that kind of a thing um, and, instead of the kind of stuff that just makes people mad. <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, the, by the way, this is from despair.com, we, we have groups that aren't really teams, although they're interested in team building development. Let me explain what I mean by that. There is a difference, and we don't want to get too technical here, but there is a difference between uh, a work group uh, and a work team. Okay, And I want you to look at this image for a second. Here's the difference. And uh, I, I want you to decide what, you, what it is that you actually supervise or what you actually manage. Uh, so we've got here a work group. The goal is kind of to share information, whereas a work team is collective performance. Okay, So it's very possible that I supervise seven employees, and they really don't have anything to do with each other, but they're my team. And so they're, they're a team simply because of where they fit on the organizational chart. Or they are a technical team, even though they don't their work isn't interdependent. Their performance is not collective in any way. And that, and that speaks to synergy as well. Um, synergy is a buzzword we hear a lot in management. Um, and all it means is that the sum is greater than, or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And in work groups, it's neutral. Um, or sometimes even negative. And what I mean by that is if I manage a group of seven people, and I'm responsible for them each making 30 widgets, it does not matter that their, their collective effort is not going to produce more than 210 widgets, right? Whereas in a, in a work team, it is possible there, that synergy can be there because of complementary skills and responsibilities and roles and that kind of a thing. Um, and this one is important to note because we're going to be talking a lot about this, this next one, uh, throughout our, our brief session here. Accountability. In a work group, it's purely individual. In other words, um, if John, my coworker, doesn't get his work done, it really has very little bearing on me, right? Whereas in a team, I'm still held responsible for my individual contribution, yet there are also uh, mutual or combined or team uh, results that we are trying to accomplish, okay? And then finally, there's skills. And in a team, in a work team, you specifically go after complementary skills to make up a team. And, and you're going to be hearing a lot of sports metaphors and analogies here because we are talking about teams. But uh, you know, when you think a basketball team, for example, you've got a rebounder, you've got a scorer, you've got a ball handler. That that's a team. If if in a work group, it's just people happen to have the same job titles and they happen to have the same manager. Well, their skill, skills might be random and varied. Okay. So again, the, sometimes we uh, the reason we're uh, coming up with this distinction is because it, it's going to change the way that we lead either our work group or our work team. Now, I will tell you there is, there is enough overlap. There, there are similarities. And in fact, we have a lot of managers that, that, or, or supervisors that manage hybrids of these. 
Okay, so they've got some of these elements that make them a work team and some of them that make them a work group. But if we were to you know, keep these distinctions specific and separate and distinctive, I, I want to ask you right now, and I'm looking for your responses here, um, would you say, given these definitions that we've just identified, that you actually supervise a work group or do you supervise a work team? Okay, now I realize some of you might be in between, but which, which way is it leaning more? We're going to give you a few seconds to go ahead and answer that. Do you, given this definition, manage a work group or a work team? Well, that's interesting. Uh, it's exactly 50-50 that people said that they manage a work group and manage a work team. Now, I, we, we could have given you the option to say some sort of hybrid where we have some elements of this and some we don't, but uh, for the sake of learning the distinctions between a work group and a work team, we didn't want to do that. So we're about 50-50 split. Well, the good news is we're going to be talking about elements that, that are applicable to both, and so if you hear me use the terms uh, team and group interchangeably, don't, don't get confused by that. Okay, um, one more way to articulate this. I just thought this was a good explanation. Uh, a work team is like a football team, for example. You've got different people with complementary skills, and yet the quarterback we know cannot complete a pass unless the wide receivers are running good routes and are willing to catch it, and the offensive line is blocking, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas a work group is more like a swim team, and outside of a relay, there really isn't much interaction. So even though I, you know, we might, let's say I'm on a high school swim team, we might, it might be a team competition, but really there's no interdependency other than, well, I hope you score well because I want to win a team thing. Does that make sense? There's not, there, there's not a lot of necessarily skill variety, and I understand that this analogy is not perfect because, you know, with a medley there, there might be, or a relay there might be, but I, I thought this was a good way of explaining the difference between a work team and a work group, okay? Now, I want to talk to you really quickly about teams or groups and norms. Now, what do we mean by norms? We could use a lot of other synonyms here to describe norms, culture, uh, customs, things like that. But teams, groups even, work groups and work teams, they form uh, norms. They develop norms and, and, and ways of doing things that are appropriate. And usually, this is unspoken. Okay, we're not talking about formal rules of conduct, but rather this is sort of that latent, uh, socially enforced ways of doing things that even the participants, even the enforcers, might not be aware that they're doing. So what are we talking about here? First, maybe appearance norms. I, I, start, I come to work for a new team or a new work group, and I quickly learn, oh, on Fridays, it's okay to dress like this. Or, oh my gosh, I wore jeans on my first Friday, and nobody does that. Okay. Whereas maybe no one ever said anything to you, you just kind of pick up on it by what the group is doing, right? Uh, similarly, there are social arrangement norms where maybe I come and work for a, a group or team and everyone realizes, no, this, we don't eat lunch together. We don't do that. We're not social like that. Or, or no one goes to eat lunch with the boss. Or these people uh, in accounting, uh, they never go and eat with the sales staff because sales staff does their own thing and they're on calls during that time or you know whatever else it might be. Now the norms that we are most interested in are performance norms. Uh, those that have taken classes from me or heard webinars from me before have heard me heard this refrain quite often. But our bottom line as supervisors is performance, right? And and so that's what we're interested in here. Some performance norms that we're interested in: how hard members. Uh, should work, their level of output, uh, how to get the job done, for example, even what level of tardiness is acceptable. All these things are enforced more than formal rules. It's those unwritten rules, those norms that groups establish, that teams establish, and then they self-enforce. So maybe I'm a, I'm a new member and I learn pretty quickly that it doesn't matter if I show up 10 minutes late. Okay, it's, it's not a big deal. No one has ever given me any flack about it. It's just I see other people come in 10 minutes late, whereas you know, some norms are, no, you, you're here three minutes early or you're late, right? I, I want to tell you about uh, a Hawthorne study. This is classic. Those of you that have taken management classes before, I've heard about Elton Mayo and uh, the, the a Hawthorne studies at Western Electric Reserve. Okay, this was a study done a long-term study in the 1920s ended in the 1930s, fascinating, okay, for what it teaches us about groups and norms and performance. The study 
was meant to uh, study sort of the, the impact of someone's physical environment on performance. In other words, well, if we put them in these kind of chairs, do they perform better? If there's more lighting, do they perform better? So the first group at this company, they, they tried, they did more lighting. They gave them better lighting. And in the 30s, you know, that's not easy to do. So they gave them better lighting. What they found is people perform better. And they're like, oh, we found something here. But what was interesting is they had another group, and they gave them worse lighting. And you know what they found? They performed better. And what they realized is that the groups that were being observed felt special. They felt status. And because they felt like all of a sudden, oh my gosh, these people from Harvard are willing to pay attention to us. We must be doing something really important. That status norm made them perform better. Okay? Now what was also interesting is they did another study with the uh, bank wiring room. And what they found is that money was less a factor okay, in monetary incentives was less a factor in determining worker output than were group norms. Here's what we, what we mean by this. Um, they, they offered incentives uh, on, on individual production levels uh, for employees in this bank wiring room at, at, at uh, Electric, Electric Western Reserve. And what they determined is that there were norms set by the group. And that is, uh, so some of the norms were you don't do too much. Uh, you don't do too little. You do your fair share. But they were worried, of course, if you were one of these people that did too much, you were going to make everyone else look bad. Okay, uh, And maybe they realize, oh my gosh, we don't need so many people because they can be doing more and they're going to lay people off. And as a group or a team, they were going to regulate that. Okay, And so you, you don't want to be a rate buster, it was called, busting the rate that, that work was going to be uh, done at. So don't do too much. Don't do too little. Here's how the norms were enforced, and this is really fascinating. By the way, this was this was this group happened to be women, right? Um, this is how the norms were enforced: sarcasm, uh, name calling. They would ridicule people that would violate the norms. There was ostracism. They would ostracize people that would violate these norms and make them feel uncomfortable. There were even punches. Uh, to people's upper arms. I don't think you could get away with that now. Um, but I mean, real hard punches, not friendly jabs to the shoulder, but really hard punches to sort of say like, hey, knock it off, you're doing too much, or you're doing too little. So I want you to think about this. Why does this matter? Why is this study so uh, significant and, and so relevant even today? That's because the norms that you establish or that you help create as a team leader are going to go further than even monetary incentives in determining group output, team productivity, uh, what is actually produced by your people. There is a level uh, of performance established by these norms. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out as supervisors and managers, well, if that's the case, how do I establish a culture or norms for my team or my work group that has high performance norms and, uh, and standards. Okay, uh, Let's look at what makes teams effective uh, here. You're going to notice there's a lot of language here, a lot of, of, of words here. And we're going to go through these in, a, in, in fairly uh, quick fashion. Uh, and so I, I want you to pay really close attention to what terms we're describing here. I don't think any of this is going to be mind-blowing, but it, it's certainly at, at a minimum going to be a good reminder to you uh, about what makes for effective teams. Okay, the first thing we want to talk about is the context. And this is adequate resources, leadership, trust and performance evaluation rewards. And we're going to get into more details of each of these. The next is composition. Okay, what are the, the individuals who make up your teams and work groups? What do they actually look like? And then finally, what is the process by which this team operates? Okay, how do they actually interact with each other? It's these three uh, general areas with these specific items in each that impact overall team effectiveness. Okay? So first we want to talk about context. Uh, does your group uh, or, or team have adequate resources? In fact, there may be, this is interesting, uh, the research indicates that there may be nothing that is more impactful to the success of a team or a group than that it is supported by the organization. So if the organization is going to function by teams, it's got to give those teams time, it's got to give them resources, it's got to give them clear direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So adequate resources really matter. 
Um, leadership matters as well, though. There's a lot of uh, popular literature out there now about sort of the leaderless team and that sort of thing. And yet it's clear that teams still need direction. They still benefit from having someone say, hey, this is how we're going to make decisions, or this is our purpose here, and I can clearly articulate that vision or that purpose to you, right? And then uh, about six months ago, we had a webinar, maybe a little bit longer, but we had a webinar on trust. And we can just never overstate how critical trust is to leadership and, and certainly to team success. Do I trust my team members? Do I think that they're really interested in the same things that I am in terms of team success? Are they looking more for individual glory? Um, do, I, do I trust that they're contributing uh, members of the team? And do I trust that when they disagree with me in, in a team conte uh, context that they're doing it based on best interest of the team and not just to sort of get me, right, or to make me look bad. And finally, in, in context, is performance evaluations and rewards. Now, <clears throat> when I teach performance management, a lot of times we talk about doing group performance uh, rewards and, and goals, and we have a lot of people that talk about how difficult that is, and yet, um, with a little bit of effort, you can make performance evaluations and rewards based on team goals and team production. We never want to get away from individual contribution entirely for reasons we'll talk about here in a second, but what we're looking for is a hybrid. Can we make it so that uh, uh, someone's individual contributions, they have standards and measures set in place of how they're going to be held accountable for that, and yet the team is also very publicly striving for certain goals, right? There seems to be, that that's a really good way of unifying a team, right? So is our context there to have successful teams? Next we want to talk about composition. I think some of this information might surprise some of you, but first we want to talk about the abilities of the members. Generally speaking, we're looking for three primary roles or abilities uh, from, from our members, okay? Uh, the first is technical competence, right? In, in other words, um, do they know what they're doing in terms of, what, of whatever it is the team is trying to accomplish? We might have people that are really good in terms of their technical abilities. The second is problem solving or decision making abilities. Do we have people that are good at, at, at saying, hey, this is how, the, here's our conundrum, here's how we should solve it, or hey, let's do a brainstorming session. People that are effective at facilitating that kind of conversation. And then the third ability that's, that's really critical to team success is interpersonal effectiveness. We have to have people that are quite frankly, good at being team players, that people like to be around, that are good at raw rawing the team, that are good at taking the emotional pulse of the team and lifting them up when they need it and calming them down when they need it. But those, generally speaking, are the abilities that we're talking about. There's also the personality of the members, right? Um, now, this, I, I realize uh, a lot of you don't have any discretion um, over the kinds of personalities that get put on your teams and work groups, but it's clear from, uh, some of you have heard of the Big Five personality test. Um, just for your information, the research, the evidence is clear that those with a high level of conscientiousness, uh, that is, they're, they're concerned about getting work done and concerned about the feelings of others, and those with a high level of openness, and those are terms from the Big Five personality test, those tend to be the best, uh, the, the, the best team members. Okay, you want you want to fill your team with with those kinds of personalities. Okay, roles is is related to personalities, and yet um, with with interdependence being a major part of teams, um, you want your star people. And this is common sense, right? But the evidence is you want your star people to fill the most important roles. So, and and, and I, I realize that might not be kosher to say, but in every team there are there are some roles that are more important to team success than others. Basically, it comes down to this, and I apologize for another sports analogy. But in high school, you generally just put your best athlete at quarterback. I mean, high schools, you don't do that necessarily at college or at the professional level, but in high school, all, it's, it, it's almost sort of a cliche that the best athlete's going to play quarterback, and that's because it's, it's the most important role in high school, and there's not a lot of technical skill developed yet, so you just put your best, most talented guy at, at quarterback, okay? Here's uh, something else that might be really interesting to you, diversity of members. 
Uh, this might not be very popular to say, but the majority of the research on diversity in teams is that cosmetic level diversity, that is race, gender, religion, um, those kinds of things, has very little impact on team success. So it is very popular to say, oh, we've got to have diversity in this team, and yet that cosmetic level diversity does very little. However, deeper level diversity, levels of experience, um, maybe education levels, uh, uh, different role experiences, right? That kind of diversity may contribute to team success. So you want to you want to differentiate between that that uh, surface uh, cosmetic level diversity and that deeper level diversity. And then finally, in composition, the size of the team. There is a tendency for managers to try and get as many people on a team as possible. And if, and if efficiency isn't an issue, a large team is actually better at creativity because there's more people involved, right? But generally speaking, the ideal size of a team is between five and nine. Okay? Now that can vary depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish, but five and nine for most work environments is the ideal team size because people aren't able to just hide out but it's not so small that it doesn't even feel like a team, right? So that's composition. And then finally, we want to talk about process, okay? And the first thing is, and this is common sense as well, is there a common purpose and plan? And this is why we need you as supervisors to be leaders of your work groups and teams. I'm, you're going to have a more effective team if I can say, this is what we're about. This is what our values are. This is what our purpose is. And in fact, the more clearly that is defined, the more special I'm going to feel being a part of that team, the more meaning you can give to whatever our purpose is. Okay, And uh, not unrelated to that is specific goals. I'm going to be motivated at a team level and an individual level if there are goals in place, okay? specific, challenging goals for me to uh, and us as a team to accomplish. Right? What about conflict levels? Uh, again, I think our last webinar was on conflict resolution, um, and, and we talked about uh, conflict being mostly unproductive, right? Um, if it's relationship-based, well, then it's, it's, it's almost always counterproductive. But if it's um, task-oriented conflict, in other words, us uh, discussing whether or not this is what our team should be about and us having disagreement on that, it can be productive. The evidence is that teams that are successful are comfortable with conflict, and yet they clearly spell out when we disagree, this is the acceptable way to handle it. In other words, they verbalize conflict norms. And they say, it is okay for you to disagree agreeably. There, there, there cannot be this, this backbiting and infighting and, and overwhelming sense of conflict, otherwise we're, we're not going to be productive. The final thing in terms of the process is social loafing. Social loafing is, look, I get to hide out because, in fact, if you've ever had group work in a school setting, you know what social loafing is. It's this idea that, well, I can hide out and not really contribute because the team's going to take care of it, right? Um, so the question is, how do you avoid social loafing? Because if you've got a social loafer, um, you're, you're not maximizing the, all the, the, the benefits of being in a team, right? Well, um, you establish, the first thing you do is you establish norms of performance. You set up that culture where it's not okay for you to be showing up two hours late because we're really invested as a team in being successful and accomplishing our goals and whatever our purpose is. So there's going to be social pressure for people to conform to the high performance norms, right? Um, the other thing, of course, is just if you've got not only group uh, goals, but individual goals that people are held, held accountable for. They can't just slack off because they're also going to be held accountable for their individual contribution, okay? So again, uh, this is it's the composition, context, and process, and and, and as you know, um, th this uh, this information is going to be made available to you. Um, so it, there's because there's a lot of things we're talking about, a lot of specifics here. And we went over it really quickly, um, but it's going to be made available to you. But I want to ask another. I want to get your thoughts on another thing here. I want to know, as team and work group work group leaders, what what is the biggest challenge for you? Is it based on something in composition? Is it based on something in context? 
and you've got all the specifics in there on your on your screen there, or is it based on something in process? What do you find as a team or work group leader poses the biggest challenge for you? Is it composition, context, or process? Okay, uh, well, here are our results. The highest was uh, process, so that's. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that might be a result of social loafing. The lowest was context, so we're not worried about leadership or trust. That's good. That's encouraging to hear. And then, and then second biggest challenge was composition. Okay, size of the team, personalities, abilities, you know, that that kind of a thing. Okay, um, this is interesting. Okay, um, so especially for what we're going to talk about next, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that the reason process was number one was because of concerns with social loafing, specific goals, and probably uh, conflict. Okay, um, so let's let's uh, let let's talk about something here because you've heard me say for a half hour now, close to a half hour, I've been talking about establishing these high performance norms, um, and, and that is really critical. Okay, uh, there's another element here to creating good teams, high-performing teams, and what we're looking for is um, high-performance norms. That is, as a team leader, and and then follow through with your people. There are norms where only good performance is accepted. But you notice the other thing is cohesion, cohesiveness. Right, that is. We we get along. We we like each other. There's interdependence. We we trust one another. Now um, cohesion is a, is a two-edged sword, right? And we've got lots of uh, teams that are really cohesive. The problem is this: it's a two-edged sword because if I've got good cohesion or cohesiveness, and and low performance norms, I am going to get low productivity. In other words. <laughs> And this is going to sound kind of funny, but if we're just a bunch of slackers, but we all get along, we're just going to help each other continue to be a bunch of slackers. Okay, so the cohesion in that um, sense is actually counterproductive, right? And yet, if you look, what we're going for in that top left quadrant there is high performance norms and high cohesion. Okay, now we just spent a little bit of time talking about how to create some of those high performance norms with individual and team goals and that and that kind of a thing and and you know composition and process and 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 all that and context all that kind of stuff the question the natural question that you should be having right now then is okay how do I create team cohesion how do I build that how do I do that cohesiveness right well let's talk about that really quickly I, I, I sense some of you are already pretty good at this um, the first thing is make the group as small as possible to get the work done we talked about five to nine being the ideal size. If you can get the work done adequately and there's enough skill variety and, and, and um, ability composition with five, that's better than nine, right? There, there is no, you don't want to get too small in that five to nine range, but if you can do five, you're, you're pretty well set. This doesn't mean if you have a team of four, all hope is lost, or if you have to manage a team of 10, all hope is lost, but, but generally speaking, make the group as small as possible. Uh, of course, be on the same page with team goals. Team goals can be very unifying. If a manager is effective, here's the problem. You can't set, just like individual goals, you can't set team goals and then ignore them for a year. You've got to be following up with your team. You've got to be holding them accountable. You've got to be excited. There's got to be a challenge there. You, you've got to be giving them encouragement and, and letting them know how they're doing. That can, that can build cohesion and, and really unify people. Increase the time members spend together. Some of you might be screaming at your screens right now saying, no, that's the last thing we want. But uh, it, it really is true that the more time a group spends together, because sociality matters, right? The more a team knows about each other appropriately, um, there tends to be cohesion. And then this one's interesting. Increase the team's status and the perceived difficulty of attaining membership. I am going to feel more sense of cohesion and belonging to my team if I feel like, oh yeah, it's awesome that I belong to this team. Okay, I know a lot of people that are promoted in their agencies that they now go to like the leadership meetings or whatever. They feel a sense of sort of pride with that, at least initially, before they learn to hate meetings like they, you know, we all hate meetings, but uh, initially there's a sense of, oh, look, I've, I've made it. So if you can make your group feel like, whoa, you're part of this team and we're an elite unit, um, there's, there's going to be that sense of purpose. It's sort of like belonging to Mensa or belonging to the Green Berets or, you know, whatever else it might be, okay? 
Um, this is another one that I really love that, I, that, that is not utilized enough with, with our team and work group leaders. Stimulate competition with other teams. I'm always, it's really always interesting to me. I've done a lot of work with UDOT, and it, it was really interesting to me the first time I worked with them when I heard Region 1 talk about Region 2 and Region 2 talk about 1 and 3, and there, there's a sense of pride there in the regions about, oh, we're the best region. We're, oh, yeah, we're way better than Region 2. Okay, and I actually think that can be very healthy for creating identity and cohesion, right? Um, I remember I just had a conversation about a month ago with a group. Uh, I don't know, I don't know their specific titles, but they're in charge of uh, lower income housing, and they they happen to be, I think, I think they work under human services. But anyway, they got their boss, their team leader, told them, by the way, Massachusetts hates us. Because the math, their, their, their counterparts in Massachusetts were like, ah, oh, Utah is kicking our butt again. And, and so they have this competition uh, with Massachusetts and Massachusetts with Utah. And Utah, thankfully, is doing a better job and being more effective at what they're doing or giving, uh, getting housing for lower income uh, uh, residents and families. But, but that can be really useful and healthy. Nothing really unifies people like competition and, and, and a common enemy. Right. Again, similar to the goals, give rewards to the team and not just individuals. There needs to be team successes that are celebrated, right, if there are going to be team goals. I think that's common sense. And then this one's interesting as well. Physically isolate the group. What that means is these retreats that some of us lament and, and, and don't look forward to can actually be very effective. And, and actually what we've seen, um, J.J. Acker and, and, and uh, the Utah Leadership Institute have created an orienteering course for uh, uh, teams to utilize. It it's, was primarily developed for CPM groups, but now we've had other teams utilize it where they, they, they go off-site and they come and they do orienteering and, and it's a team building exercise and, and we're developing some new team building exercises as well. And, and those can actually be really effective. If any of you remember that movie, Remember the Titans, with Denzel Washington, and, and he's got these, these two different high schools that have to come together that were uh, traditionally segregated. And what he does is he takes them to uh, an off-site camp, and this is not uncommon for football teams, but uh, he takes them to Gettysburg, right? And, and they have that sort of uh, trip together, and, and the team was different. It was a team. It was not a team before they left. It was a team when they came back. Believe it or not, there is some evidence that these kinds of retreats and things, physically isolating the groups uh, can work to, to uh, build your team. So I would, I would encourage you, when feasible, to take advantage of those kind of opportunities. I know there are lots available. The Utah Leadership Institute offers them as, as well as uh, other groups. Okay. So now I want to talk about something here. We're, we're coming to an end here, and I, I want to talk to you about just a couple more things. I suspect some of you have some questions right now, or, or, or if, if we were talking face-to-face, -face, you'd say, Dan, this is all well and good, but what if I have people that are just, for lack of a better term, cancers on the team? Okay? How, do, how do I create team players? How do I get people that are good teammates and that kind of thing. Well, I, I wish I had a magic bullet for you, but the truth is it's the same uh, three things for developing any capacity in your people. Right? The first is you hire team players. That is you actually interview, behaviorally interview, uh, for people that would make good team players. Now keep in mind what I talked about earlier. There are certain personality types that make better team members. You could even administer as part of your interviewing process or selection process the Big Five personality test, and if and if it mattered enough to you, you could hire for those personality types, right? Um, or you could just do it in the the traditional interviewing fashion. The second is you train team players. Uh, a lot of people, this is how they do it. They there are people that are not team players because of their personalities, and then there's some that don't realize how important it is and they don't know how to be effective team players. And, and so um, training people, giving them the skills uh, on how to develop teams and how to be good team members is the second way. And then the third way is you reward team behavior. You, you actually hold people accountable for being good teammates and being good team members, right? You put it in a performance plan. You, you define that for them. You articulate that for them. You give them a vision of what it means. You get their buy-in, and, and then you hold them accountable for it. Um, I, I, you know, again, I wish there was a magic bullet, but, but if 
these are they, right? This, this is the, the common sense approach to how you build team players, okay? And so uh, I, I know that some of you will say, well, I can't get rid of this person, so I can't hire them, and they're a cancer on the team. They, they, it does, training is not going to make a difference. What do I do? Hold them accountable for being a, a, a team player, okay? That's really where that, that um, final solution comes in, okay? Uh, one one other issue, and that is that it may be, remember we talked about the difference between work groups and teams. I don't want you to necessarily feel that teams are automatically a more ideal approach than, than a traditional work group or even just getting work done through a collection of individuals, right? It may be that that's the answer. So when, when, when aren't uh, teams the answer, right? Well, you need to ask yourself, can the work be done better by one person? Right? Do I really need to make them be a team, or do they just really have individual tasks and I manage a group of individuals? Right? Simpler tasks are done better by individuals. Okay? It's not good to you know, force a team to accomplish these simple tasks. Um, so you want to ask yourself that. And similarly, does the work create a common purpose or set of team goals as opposed to an aggregate of individual goals? Look, if it's just individual goals, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe you manage uh, a work uh, group of a of, uh, collection of individuals that do individual work, manage them well, lead them individually. You don't necessarily need to worry about this team stuff. And then finally, what is the level of interdependence? Think about this, the football team where the interdependence is high. I don't make that pass if you don't block versus the swim team where there just happens to be a collection of scores. Right? If the interdependence isn't that high, Maybe, maybe teams aren't the best approach. Maybe you don't need to be forcing this teamwork approach onto your groups. Okay? Now, the, the last thing I want to talk to you about is, is a thing called the five dysfunctions of a team. And this, the reason I want to share this with you is it's another viewpoint, and it's a nice summation of a lot of the principles that we've been talking about here. Um, the five dysfunctions of a team. So you see there from the bottom up <coughs> an absence of trust. Uh, we talked about trust, a fear of conflict, uh, a lack of commitment to the team, an avoidance of, count of uh, accountability, social loafing, and an inattention to results, to team results as opposed to just individual contributions or things like that. So the question is, what do you do about these things? Okay. Well, for an absence of trust, what you do is you identify and discuss individual strengths and weaknesses. What is everyone bringing to the team? If I were to have a team me meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting, or work session, and I, as the leader, am the, was the first to talk about um, my weaknesses and what I'm not bringing to this team and what I think my strengths are. What I'm doing is I'm establishing a climate of trust. I'm saying it's okay to be vulnerable, and you're not going to be shot down for your vulnerability. That creates a climate of trust. Okay? There are other things you can do, of course, make sure that you're walking the talk and that your, your integrity is high. And again, we had a webinar on, on trust. It's still available to you on the employee gateway. Okay? What about fear of conflict? Um, acknowledge that conflict can sometimes be productive, that you want, it's okay for people to disagree. You've got to establish that up front. Uh, and then you've got to learn people's different conflict styles and set conflict norms. You've got to say, okay, as a team, this is how we want to engage in conflict, okay? And, and, and set that as a norm and a standard of, of conflict behavior. Um, what about lack of commitment, right? That tends to happen in teams uh, uh, occasionally. Uh, you need to review the purpose of the team after each meeting. You need to remind people about why they are a team, that important purpose that they're trying to accomplish. Okay, um, and and then also uh, uh, re review specific obligations that people have to the team and and to the overall team goals. Um, and and do not let. Here's the thing. You, this is related to conflict. It's okay for you to have a conflict in that team meeting, but you have to agree that you're going to adopt that disagree and commit mentality. That is, we'll disagree here, but once we leave this meeting, we have to get back to uh, committing despite our disagreement. Whether that means we're going to agree to disagree or whether we're going to be here until we resolve it, we, can't, we have to leave with unanimity of purpose and, and, and uh, unanimity of, of a sense of team. Okay. Uh, what about avoidance of accountability? Well, Lencioni says uh, you got to communicate those goals and standards of behavior often. 
okay, not once a year or whatever else it might be, and regularly discuss, give people um, uh, uh, feedback on how they're doing against those performance standards individually and as a team, right? This is, again, this is not rocket science, but it might mean you've got to, it might be a little more labor intensive than what you're currently doing. And then the last thing is that inattention to results, uh, keep the team focused on tangible group goals and, and reward individuals based on the team goals and collective success. It cannot just be individual, it's got to be, hey, as a team, we did this, right? Let, let's have a pizza party or, you know, whatever else it might be. But uh, that's, that's how you're going to keep that, that attention to results, keep people focused on, on what matters, okay? Um, so again, team building is an important concept. It is, uh, it, it is something that is not rocket science. It's not the most difficult thing in the world. And, and, and the good news is this. We have 50% of you say you manage a work group. 50% of you say you manage a, a, a work team. That's good. There is enough overlap in the principles that, that these things will still apply. Do not necessarily feel like, oh, I manage a work group as opposed to a team, so I'm not as effective. That, that couldn't be further from the truth. It just depends on the nature of the work that you do. Just make sure that you have the right approach based on the principles that we discussed today. There is no question that teams can be very effective, but so often we don't follow good team building principles. We don't have those high performance norms with that high cohesion or cohesiveness. Um, we don't follow, we don't establish good composition. We don't have good context. We don't have good processes in place. Um, you've got to make sure those, those things that we talked about are there. Let me just tell you in conclusion, this will be available uh, on the employee gateway uh, in a couple days. This will be archived and available to you. Uh, that'll include the PowerPoint as well as the audio. Um, but also, uh, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to go to LinkedIn, and we're going to continue to th this discussion. And the reason we do that is this is a one-way form of communication. Mostly, we have you guys respond to polls, and you guys can answer questions here at the end. But really, the real value of learning is that we've got a hundred. 50 people listening to this webinar, and that's 150 different viewpoints on what makes effective teamwork. So go to LinkedIn, um, go to DR, DHRM's Utah Leadership Institute as a group on, on LinkedIn, and join in the conversation with us as we talk about team building, what works, what doesn't, what you disagree with, what, what, with what we've talked about, what you think works, um, what your experiences have been. We'll, we'll pose some questions. You can pose your own questions. For those that have participated in the past, I think it's been a good experience, so I'd encourage you to do that. Thank you for your attendance, and we'll go ahead and answer any questions or, or entertain any comments that you might have right now. But uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, here's one question. What were the personality factors you mentioned to make good team players? Well, let me first say you want to you wanna know the big five, okay, big five personality test. But within the big five, the, the two most important were conscientiousness and openness, okay? Um, and and there, as you can imagine, there are five personalities in the big uh, five personality test. But it was conscientiousness and openness. Good question, by the way. Uh, here's another question. What do you see as the mo the main most important difference when building a team versus building members of a work group? I, I think the most Im the the big most important difference is that uh, is the nature of the work. It's that collective um, interdependence. Um, so, so don't get me wrong. I could, uh, I could be the manager of a work group, and I think it's still good to build cohesion, right? And and take some of those team elements. But the thing that really differ, differentiates a work group from a work team is the interdependent nature of the work. That is, I depend on you for our team success and for what I'm doing. I need your help. Other, you know, if it's just individualized, it's more a work group. But to me, that is the biggest difference the biggest distinction. But that doesn't mean that if I manage a work group, I don't want to build cohesion or high performance norms or have high performance standards, right? Thank you. That, that, that's also a really good question. Um, let me thank you again for your participation uh, today uh, on the webinar. We, we try and bring you topics that you communicate to us would be of interest to you. Uh, I suspect we will have another webinar in December. We know it's a busy month. Uh, both professionally and personally. Um, so look for an announcement regarding that.